and we'll find the farm Windermere, which belongs to the other Roberts, uh, the cousins, uh, has a riverfront property, which will be very important to our story. Now we talk about the Roberts family. They're the key players in this. We get to the fourth generation of Pencoid Roberts. And we have Isaac Roberts, there you see him on the left, and over on the right, the other brother, Algernon Roberts, and he established right next door the farm Windermere. Isaac Roberts' oldest son was Algernon Roberts. Algernon's oldest son from Windermere was Percival Roberts. Those two were very, very interested in the Industrial Revolution. This is the fifth generation of Roberts. They are going to depart from farming. They're the first generation not to farm, but to take up this whole new world of industry. And together they will help kick off, for at least for America, the Industrial Revolution. The two cousins came together with the land on the riverfront, with help, financial help from the two fathers, Isaac and Algernon, and they established the Pencoid Iron Works in 1852. And this is roughly uh, what it looked like, depicted from a drawing. Wondering about the hills beyond it, th that's actually today West Laurel Hill Cemetery. So they're right there on that river. Their first business, and this is why I put the, the little advertisements at the bottom. The very first business they started was railroad wheels for railroad cars and axles. This is because there were three railroads operating in southeastern Pennsylvania. There was the Lehigh Valley Railroad. There was the Reading Railroad. At the time, the largest business corporation in the world, one of the first business conglomerates. And then the third railroad was what was soon to become the biggest uh, business in the world, the Pennsylvania Railroad. And they were doing business with railroad car parts, mostly axles and wheels, when they first started in 1852, it was a good cash flow uh, product for them. But by 1859, the Roberts family, Pencoid Iron Works, got into the bridge building business. And this was very key. This is where they really emerged as one of the premier companies of our country. I have to point out to you that at the time of I would say 1840s to the 1850s, bridge building hadn't changed much since the days of the Roman Empire. It was still concrete, stone, brick, spanned short distances with wood perhaps. And if they had to span long distances, they would form arches with their masonry building projects. But these bridges were expensive. They were hard to build, took amounts, a large amount of engineering. And they were expensive. And then along comes the technology of ironworking and steelworking. Here in this country, up with the Erie Canal, there's a guy named Squire Whipple in 1842, and he invented what became the truss bridge. This photograph is an excellent example of a truss bridge. Um, the truss bridge was the invention of a Squire Whipple. But I have to point out at this point that George Roberts, the younger brother of Algernon, the partner, along with Percival Roberts, were schoolmates at the brand new Rensselaer Technical Institute in Troy, New York. Up there, they met many other people just like them, fascinated with the burgeoning Industrial Revolution. One of those classmates of theirs was a guy named John Murphy, who was a protege of Squire Whipple. Therefore, they hired Murphy, and they got the license from Squire Whipple to make these truss bridges. I show you a photograph of this particular truss bridge because this one's located over the railroad tracks at 52nd Street. You can see this anytime you ride the Paley Local, really inbound or outbound, but you really see it on the outbound, out the right side window. It's at 52nd Street. You'll see Overbrook High School on the left, Lowe's Home Center on the right. 
that bridge is, is a departure from the main line, which takes the Pennsylvania Railroad up the Schuylkill River Valley to the coal regions above Pottsville, Pennsylvania. And I point that out because this is the bridge where they brought the coal back. So imagine the enormous amount of weight that had to be handled by a bridge with the biggest and largest locomotives, sometimes two or three locomotives, and then car after car laden with anthracite hard coal coming over that bridge. And look at the enormous span. And that is the miracle of modern engineering. And that is what Pencoid led the country with, with that product. I have to point out that 1876 was a seminal year for Pencoid Iron Works. Uh, sadly, Algernon, the cousin from Pencoid, died of what I would call fluke circumstances. The lancing of a carbuncle resulted in an infection. He died in 1876. Very sad. It seems that he was a very well-liked, very much respected person. But when he died, his ownership share was purchased by the younger brother of Percival of Windermere. His name was Theodore. And so from that time forward, from 1876 on, Pencoid Ironworks was owned entirely by the Roberts family of Windermere, and the Pencoid family was no longer in it. But important to know, George B. Roberts of uh, Pencoid would become very much involved. We'll get to that soon. Um, Pencoid Iron Works supplied the iron. It built this building. And this whole exhibition, this centennial celebration, was powered by one large revolutionary new Corliss manufactured steam engine. And when the celebration was over, Pencoid Iron Works bought that steam engine and they used that to power the Pencoid Iron Works. And that supplied the power on up until the electrical age when they then converted over to electrical energy. Now I have to mention George Brooks Roberts because he's key in this story. He never had an ownership position in Pencoid Iron Works, but he became employed by the Pennsylvania Railroad in 1862. I just wanna remind you, he's a graduate of the Rensselaer Polytech Institute. He was also on the faculty of Rensselaer. So he's highly respected in the world of technology. He was hired as a special assistant to the president of the Pennsylvania Railroad. He was in charge of all civil engineering, bridge building, and major building construction. That is really key because who's the best at all of that? Pencoid Ironworks, his, uh, his cousin, uh, the Robertses. I forgot to mention in the earlier slide, 1876 is when Percival Roberts Jr. joined the Pencoid Iron Works. That will become notable soon to come. But keep in mind that over on the Pennsylvania Railroad, we have a very influential member of the Roberts family, George Brooke Roberts. By the late 1860s, Pencoid was now getting in the building business. This photograph you see is the railroad train shed of what was to become the Broad Street Station in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. For anybody of that time, to see this structure was absolutely miraculous. Look at the span of that lower beam, how far it spans. And nobody could understand how that could hold up. They didn't realize that the support didn't come from underneath, the support came from the arch and all the lattice work in between there. That was the expert engineering of the finest engineers in our country, the engineers that worked at the Pencoid Iron Works. And this is the kind of building that they were generating out of that factory. Now, I wanna point out that the same technology <clears throat> that allows for these magnificent spans also allow for vertical development. Um, while I was in the lumber business, I attended um, a lecture on construction in which a construction engineer pointed out, and this was probably about uh, 2008, 2009, he pointed out, we haven't yet built the tallest building possible. We built the tallest building anybody wants to occupy, 
but, we, but our technology of iron and steel could take us much further higher. And this is what the Roberts family knew and understood. The potential for iron and steel was just magnificent beyond anybody's wildest imagination. Remember, looking at this train stead, it was very rare to find any building more than five stories high. Uh, it, was, it could be done, but it was very, very difficult. Now, this is a rather grainy photograph taken from the Maniunk side of the Schuylkill River, looking at the lowest down river side of the Pencoid Ironworks. You'll see in a subsequent photograph that it extends much more. What this is, though, this is the steel foundry. This is where they made steel. By 1880, Percival Roberts Jr. was aware that the Pencoid Ironworks was soon to be in the steel business and they would become A&P uh, Steel Company and they were going to lead the way in steel works. And at this point, we have to talk about one of the stars of this book, Percival Roberts Jr., the son of per Percival Roberts, the founder of Pencoid Ironworks. Once again, in the Roberts tradition, very well educated, educated at the Episcopal Academy, which in those days was downtown Philadelphia. He attended the Haverford College and ultimately the University of Pennsylvania. He joined the Pencoid Ironworks at the age of 19 and became immediately enthusiastic. And he literally worked in every aspect and division of the Pencoid Ironworks, becoming an expert at every facet of the works. He grew and developed Pencoid Iron Works with the bridge building, the building construction, the high rise skyscrapers, to the point that it, while well, as a practical matter, simply outgrew its Balakinwood location. In order to handle all the work that was coming to Pencoid, because they were very much in demand, remember their primary customer, the Pennsylvania Railroad, was now the largest corporation in the world. So in the 1800s, the Pencoid Ironworks, under the leadership of Percival Roberts Jr., merged with about 25 other companies of their same sort throughout the Mid-Atlantic uh, area, all the way out to Pittsburgh. And they formed a brand new company called the American Bridge Company. And out of those 25 companies, Percival Roberts Jr. emerged as the president of the American Bridge Company. And an even greater testimony to the fine people of, of Pencoid Ironworks, many of the top executives of the Pencoid Ironworks became the top executives of the American Bridge Company, even after being merged with 25 other companies. And it's interesting that American Bridge, as was, only lasted about two years. By 1902, the, the most influential banker of the age, the first activist banker of all time, J. Pierpont Morgan, developed the Steel Trust. It was called the United States Steel. And basically what Morgan did was he combined Carnegie Steel of Pittsburgh with federal steel located in the Chicago area, and then grabbed a lot of other steel companies into that same net, one of which was the American Bridge Company. And so American Bridge, Pencoid Ironworks, along with American Bridge, got enveloped into that large, largest corporation of the time, really, United States Steel Corporation, the largest capitalized company in the world. But Percival Roberts Jr., who we see right here, right out of Balakin with Pennsylvania, had a seat on the board, on the very first board of the United States Steel. 1902, he was on that board, the first board of directors. And he held his seat on the board of directors of the United States Steel until his death in 1943. And as far as I can figure out, I don't know of any other director of the United States Steel who held their seat on the board that long. It really is a testimony to how venerated he was within the industry of ironworking and steelmaking, that he sat on that board of the largest corporation in the world, really for two generations.
And now we get to an area which I think is very important to all of us of Lower Marion. I want to point out to the bottom photograph, that panoramic photograph in those days, they just kept <laughs> turning the camera and putting the pictures together. But you'll see at the far left down river is the steel making plant of Pancoy. Then you have the rolling plant and the forging plant, blacksmith shop all the way till you get to the very far right. And then you'll see the bridge making facility and the rivet making factory. I would say the Pencoid probably spanned about a mile and a half of riverfront of the Schuylkill River in Lower Marion. The Schuylkill River is our Northern border here in Lower Marion. It's, <clears throat> excuse me, the Schuylkill River is six and a half miles of Lower Marion. And I would say the Pencoid works took up about a mile and a half of it at its zenith. I am led to believe, and I can't find the exact numbers, but I, I'm led to believe that at its high tide mark, when it was at its biggest, Pencoid uh, hired somewhere between four to 6,000 employees in this facility. I want to play, Kevin, uh, you'll see the photographs of the employees here. The one on the right is the working crew, the people that actually worked in the factory. And I circled a gentleman there. Uh, that's Walter Ryder. That's the great grandfather of our author, Kevin Ryder. Taken a few years later is a photograph of the executives who worked in the office. And circled again is Walter Ryder, chief mechanic. He was in charge of anything that moved. To be chief mechanic, at Pencoid Ironworks uh, was a very respectable position to have sure. in the industrial age. I just want to point out that in that executive staff there, you will see some of the finest engineers of the time. And they came from all over. They came from Scotland. They came from Ireland. Many of them came from Germany. And this was the origin, if you will, of the melting pot. Now, I I always give credit for that melting pot to the Reading Railroad. They were the first ones to actively bring in um, immigrants from all over to be productive in the coal business. But Pencoid did likewise. They brought in people and they worked side by side. Over on the labor side, that photograph, many of those, those people came from all over too. You have Germans, you have Italians, but a lot of them are Albanians who came here by way of Italy. And uh, they, many of those families remain with us today in the area we call Belmont Hills. In those days, it was called Pencoid. Pencoid had its own post office. It had its own school. It was its own community with many residential homes. And it was a train stop on the Reading Railroad. And this, to me, is a very American story, partly, and not in a small part, because here in America, you would have different nationalities and ethnic groups living in the same community, working among the same guilds, sharing technological information. And this is where the genius of our industry really blossomed and far exceeded Europe which is where a lot of the invention took place. Remember in those days, Europe had the universities. Europe is where people made these inventions. But over here is where it was improved and developed far beyond what they ever knew in, in Europe. And that is a point worth dwelling on. I do want to point out that Pencoid was very much a part of the character of the main line of Lower Marion. Um, I would point out that between 1880 and certainly 1930, if not World War II, to the main line, to Lower Marion in particular, there was a certain panache to our area. There was a certain oh, je ne sais quoi. And I would say that that particular je ne sais quoi were, were these kind of people. The Pennsylvania Railroad, seven of the presidents, there are 14 presidents of the Pennsylvania Railroad, seven of them lived in Lower Marion and many, many other executives lived in Lower Marion. We had a base in our population of engineers, 
of industrial-minded people who thought very soberly, very rationally, really mathematically, like the, like the, like the Kelpians in a sense. The Pennsylvania Railroad was the largest corporation in the world and it was no accident. The Pennsylvania Railroad met all of its financial obligation, was run in a very financially conservative way. Met all its trade obligations, never met for, uh, for 100 years, never failed to meet a dividend. And it was really void of any significant scandal. They were very conscientious. It was run by engineers. Nearly all the presidents of the Pennsylvania Railroad until into the 20th century, they weren't businessmen, they were engineers. They were civil engineers and in some cases, mechanical engineers, but they were engineers. They were nuts and bolts people. And uh, I, I think that we've been mischaracterized by Hollywood and the popular culture. I think this is more of what Lower Marion has always been about in the main line. And so with that, <laughs> oh, sorry, with that, um, that basically concludes the formal aspect of my presentation. It'd be my pleasure to field any questions. All right, well, thank you, Perry. That was, uh, man, that was educational. <laughs> Definitely learned a lot. Um, got some questions that I'll bring here. Um, first question is, are there pictures and history of those properties? What does the house what does the farmhouse at Saks look like? Oh, anybody who has a copy of Lower Mary in the first 300 years, we have pictures of the Pencoid. And in fact, we have pictures of all of them. We have a very extensive uh, cataloging of all the mainline mansions, and certainly Pencoids included. A lot of that, almost all of that, I believe, is available on the website. Uh, LowerMarionHistory.org. And, uh, but just a funny little anecdote. Um, the Pencoid farmhouse was, was large and nice, but it was in fact a farmhouse and it was a Quaker farmhouse. So it was plain. Um, during, the during the era of industrialization, railroads and so forth, one of the favorite architects of the industrial revolution um, was Frank Furness or Furness. And so George Roberts, who worked with Furness a lot, said, come to my farmhouse and spruce it up a little bit, give it, give it a little jazz. And so Frank Furness did, and we have photographs of, of what the Roberts farmhouse looked like after Frank Furness got a hold, very fanciful, very elaborate. And after George Roberts died, his son, George Britton Roberts, tore all that stuff up and turn it back into the original Pencoy farmhouse. <laughs> <laughs> but to answer your question, yes, we have photos of all those homes. Okay, um, that bridge at 52nd Street, well, slow down guys, that bridge at 52nd Street seems over-engineered. Why not put a middle pier support between the tracks? Uh, I'll stop there. Okay. Because Leon, seems to have responded to that, and then I'll let you respond to the response. This okay, well, Leon knows better than I do. But to be honest with you, I wasn't in the loop on that one. That was designed in 1880. And <laughs> so nobody let me, no, nobody filled me in, but I presume they wanted that span for the sake of other trackage. But you know what, I'll defer to Leon, because I know Leon is very knowledgeable about this. All right, then unfortunately, Leon is gonna uh, contradict you. This bridge was built around 1910 to allow northbound trains heading towards Norristown. This included heavy freight trains powered by steam engines. Okay. That, it was actually a, a great separated crossing is the best way. That way uh, a train headed to Norristown uh, would not get in the way of a train um, coming from uh, uh, Broad Street Station headed towards Paoli. It was a great separation. Uh, that, that whole interchange there is very cleverly done. If you remember the line, uh, when, you, when you go into the city from the uh, Maniunk line, uh, there's a tunnel that takes you under uh, the railroad and then you land up uh, headed uh, into the city. 
That's the that's one part. The, the bridge is part of that same puzzle. But in those days, there was a lot of traffic uh, coming up uh, towards Reading, and that built that bridge was built strongly so that they could carry uh, heavy trains with uh, heavy engines uh, uh, up, up the line. That was built, uh, I think the date is around 1913, 1910, approximately 19, 1910, uh, when they upgraded the line and got rid of a lot of the grade crossings uh, through uh, Lower Marion Township. Okay, I'll do my homework. This this event is turning into a revelation of all sorts of types. Thanks, Leon. That's awesome. Um, the second part of that questioner's question is, and I think, Perry, this is right in your wheelhouse. How did Pencoid compare in revenues with other local iron makers like William Sellers and later Midvale Steel? Okay. I... It's not in the book. <laughs> and all that I know about Pencoid's in the book. Um, my understanding is Pencoid was a privately held company. And so nobody gets to see those numbers. I doubt that they were anywhere as big as many of the large steel companies like Carnegie, Lackawanna, even Bethlehem Steel. Um, I doubt that they had those kind of revenues. I think that was part of the reason that they needed to merge into what became American Bridge Company. They just could not generate any more revenue. I think the real reason, according to the book, is they had more orders than they could fill. And they wanted to fill the orders. But uh, I, I don't know how they compared. I'm going to guess that the revenues were much smaller than the really big ones. Okay, thanks. From Marianne, um, as I understand it, the cordless engine from the Centennial was purchased by George Pullman and moved to the Pullman Palace Car Works in Pullman, Illinois, where it is now part of the Pullman State Historic Site. A smaller scale model of the Centennial cordless engine was built for the new, sorry, was built was built for the new the Smithsonian Arts and Industries Building opened in 1881. And I read that as well. That is conflicting with what I've read elsewhere. I have been told <laughs> that the Corliss went to Pencoid. So again, maybe I have some homework to do. I tended to believe this, um, but uh, I'll, again, I'll do my homework on that one. Uh, I was told it was a big deal. That, that they got the steam engine. So I, I believed it when I read it. By the way, I, may, I'm, I might want to point out to you, throughout all of this, I frequently run into conflicting information from various sources. And sometimes you just have to say, I like this source better than that source for whatever reason. But I understand. I'll look into it. That's history. All right, um, from Mike. Mike B, what happened World War II and after with the company? Pancoid essentially shut down around 1939. They reopened again, and I'm, I'm fuzzy on the details of what closing means and open, but they did open Pancoid, and Pancoid was operating and working during World War II, and I'm led to believe that that was for the sake of the war effort. And then right after 1944, closed right down. All right, thanks. From Chuck, what parts of the works are still standing? The office. <laughs> That's about it. Um, it's all now condominiums. It's called the M District. Um, you'll, there's a hotel there. Mm -hmm. And then there's a um, apartment building there. None. The last I saw, I couldn't find any real part of the Pencoid factory works at all. I think they've all been dismantled. No, the original, the office building is there. That's what I said. The office is all that's left. Crap. Um, from Ann, did they put waste product in the river? <laughs> 
We'll never know. <laughs> I, um, and it depends on what you mean by waste products. I am aware actually that some of the waste products were not. Again, I'm made aware by the book. This, this is really what I know about Pencoy. Um, <clears throat> but Kevin Ryder talks about how his great grandfather told him that they would have large vats of waste product chemicals that were taken elsewhere. But uh, would their refuse be acceptable by today's standards? I really doubt it. They belched a lot of smoke, and I think a lot of waste product went into the Schuylkill River. Um, this was said to be privately, but I'll ask the question without identifying the asker. What is the criteria for a quote unquote mansion? I live in a home in Ballakinwood that was built in 1880. I'm interesting in compiling history. Interested, excuse me, interested in compiling history. I agree with them. I think I live in a mansion. And to me, it is. <laughs> I don't know what qualifies specifically for a mansion. Perhaps I'll have to look that up. I, I Actually, it brings up an interesting point to me. Um, it's land. Well, what's that? It's often a building on land of significant territory to qualify as a mansion. Well, okay, I still say I live in a mansion. <laughs> and yet I don't, nobody would say that. The, a lot of people talk in terms of mainline mansions, mainline estates and so forth. The very, I think this is a relative term. The enormous, elaborate, impressive mansions were really in Chestnut Hill. We're really in places like White Marsh and- um, In house. <laughs> other areas of, uh, uh, really Chestnut Hill is where I think of it. Here in Lower Marion, we had very nice homes. We had some large nice homes. We had beautiful properties. But if you were to compare them to, I don't know, Fifth Avenue in New York City at that same time, not even close. We, we, we don't stand a chance. If you were to compare our mainline mansions uh, to the beautiful elaborate estates of the Hudson River Valley, again, we don't compare to that as far as my observation goes. And though our homes are all very nice, it's a very nice area. I never saw Lower Marion in that time as being the super wealthy. And this is sort of my point where I think there's some deception here. We had wealthy people, but they weren't wealthy compared to what you found in New York City Fifth Avenue, where you had the A. Pierpont Morgans, the Carnegie's, the Fricks, and pe uh, the people of that sort. What is a mansion? I, I really don't know. I've never studied it, but we, we do catalog all of these grand, beautiful homes of Lower Marion. They're cataloged on our website at lowermarionhistory.org. Uh, Okay, um, from Joan, when at West Laurel Hill Cemetery, there are signs leading to the Pencoid Bridge, where is it located and is it in use today? I'm sorry, I couldn't quite hear the full question. I, I didn't either. <clears throat> when at West Laurel Hill Cemetery, there are signs leading to the Pencoid Bridge, where is it located and is it in use today? Oh, yes. Uh, the Pencoid Bridge is there at the end of Writer's Ferry Road, actually. When you take Writer's Ferry Road down from Belmont Avenue, you will pass an entrance to, to the cemetery. Keep on going down the hill underneath the railroad tracks. That's still the extension of Writer's Ferry Road. It was simply bought by the, the, the Roberts family. Follow that out and that will take you to the Pencoid Bridge which then spans the Schuylkill River, takes you to Manny Elk. Yeah, so um, Joan, I'll give you my answer because I've done this before. Um, if you're in the cemetery, keep going down until you can't go down any further. Go out that exit, turn left, keep going down, and you end up at the bridge. All right, from Marion Levine. Are any of the buildings still standing? Were the old buildings 
that were recently torn down, and I think this is, I'm adding, editorializing, torn down near the CVS to build apartments, part of the original complex. Oh, actually, no, maybe not. So were any of the buildings that were torn down at the end of the end of going down part of the original complex? All right, well, if you're talking about where CVS is, Flat Rock Road. So I, I think I misdirected. Just think about coming out of the cemetery. Hill Road. Going down. Yeah. Okay. The new buildings that are being built now, the new apartments near yeah. the AFC. Right. Right. Belmont Avenue. Right. Uh, near the Green Lane Bridge. That's like, I don't uh, know. Uh, Mansion unit, I think. Oh, I'm, I'm talking about um, in the rock all the way down. Is it the, uh, what do they call those new apart? Um, the ones right near the Pencoid Bridge. Yeah. You know? So the buildings that are there, uh, that used to be there, that are um, where a the um, AFC Fitness Center is. Yeah. Exactly. Royal Athena. That's it. I couldn't yeah. remember the name. Yeah, I'm sorry. I misdirected. Excuse me. All of the Pencoid working buildings, you know, where, where the actual iron and steel working took place, they're gone. They've been demolished and removed. And in this place have been the buildings you see there today. The only building that remains from all that we see, and you can see that photograph, um, is the brick, the beautiful brick office building. That's all that remains. So the buildings that were, were taken down years that were falling down that that were all decrepit um i don't know whether they were warehouse or from the steel built from the steel works the, the buildings that were destroyed for the athena came from the Connolly container factory i see thank you okay. but all of those buildings are gone from Jack, can you expand on what aspects of American business, parentheses, specifically at Pencoid, for example, in parentheses, allowed it to develop and expand on technologies that were originally invented in Europe? Was it access to cheaper labor, resources, et cetera, or something else? Could you please give me the first part of that question? Yeah. Can you expand on what aspects of American business, parentheses, specifically at Pencoid, for example, in parentheses, allowed it to develop and expand on technologies that were originally invented in Europe? Was it? Oh, okay. Um, the answer to that is an opinion. And I'm always happy to give an opinion. You don't have to agree with it. I think the genius of America, it applies to Pencoy, but it applies to many places, is there was, we were free of the encumbrance of royalty and nobility and all of that. In this country, we, we were pretty much left on our own. And um, the other thing that I think is the genius of it is all of these different people from many different places came together lived near each other and worked near each other. Now, one, of, one example I have of this is um, guns were a very important item for everybody to have at that time. The finest guns in the world were made in England, Germany, but the very best guns were made in Belgium. And, that, and, and yet over here in America, in towns like Sinking Springs and Anvil and Littlestown, Pennsylvania. The finest breakthrough in technology of gun making happened in those little towns. It's the Kentucky Long Rifle, the, what I call the Pennsylvania Long Rifle. And the reason it came about was because in those towns you had people from Scotland, people from Ireland, and people from Germany and Belgium, all living in the same town, all talking to each other, and all sharing trade secrets with each other, Guns, for example, were made in a guild. One guy would do the stock, another guy would do the barrel, and so forth. And this, I think, happened at Pengoy. You had people, like I said, from Germany, Scotland, Ireland, 
all coming together with their engineering knowledge and sharing that knowledge. I think that's the genius of America, where it could be invented in England, but once it came to America, man, it blossomed, and there was no encumbrance. There was no royalty, as I said. There was nobody telling you what tree you're allowed to cut down or anything like that. So I think it was the freedom, my opinion. Okay, and I think following up on that is our last question for this evening, um, because I think it follows on from that concept, were black Americans employed also in the melting pot? I have no evidence of that in the Pencoid works. I'm not saying it didn't happen, that there, that there weren't blacks, in, in, but I have no evidence of it. I also, um, I, I did quite a bit of studying on the Reading Railroad and I found no blacks there either. Um, the really strong migration of African Americans to our area here really came after World War II. So we did have African Americans here, but there weren't many, in my opinion. And I defer to Jerry Francis, who was on this um, meeting, because he's actually studied this a great deal more than I have. But they don't seem to be partaking in the Industrial Revolution. And that's as far as I can take it. Uh, Jerry, any comment? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. OK. Um, when you talk about the African-Americans, it's a long, complicated story. But at least to address that question, uh, you, after the Civil War, uh, OK, um, there is a African-American population in South Ardmore. After the Civil War, they encouraged their relatives that were free slaves from down south to come up here to Ardmore because there was employment. And there was employment for a while. But then in 1900, another industrial giant came along called Autocar, which was a uh, manufactured uh, delivery trucks. They were there from 1900 to about 1957. Um, that's another lecture we're working on. They employed blacks. African Americans. Uh, they employed whites, blacks, women, and children, women and uh, men working side by side. Uh, Lewis S. Clark was the owner of that organization, and he was uh, very advanced in his uh, thinking. And yes, the idea with the melting pot. The one of the main reasons, I was, my opinion is, after studying that history of Autocar, is you got all these people together, and they came up with a better product than their competitors because they invented the spark plug and things like that. So yes, we did have African Americans uh, in, in the uh, in Ardmore. Okay. Um, I'm feeling I'm feeling a little bit like Terry Gross. Uh, I'm going to summarize some of the additional comments um, and then make my own pitch and then hand it back to you, Janet. So from Daniel. After graduation from John Hopkins around 1925, my grandfather was a young engineer at Pencoid. He recalled the drafting room as the United Nations of Engineers. His first project was the South Street Bridge, recently replaced. John T. Martin went on to have a career as a suspension engineer with American Bridge from the 1930s to 1964, finishing with the Verrazano Narrows Bridge. And my personal note on that is my uncle always said it was the most beautiful bridge in the world. And then from Mike, the 52nd Street Bridge flyover was built to allow the Pensies, I think, uh, I assume that's Pennsylvania train railroad system, whatever it was, the Pensies flagship Broadway Limited the high-speed passenger train to Chicago to fly straight through West Philadelphia without being held up by long coal trains coming down the Schuylkill Valley. Okay, so before I hand it back to Janet, um, first of all, obviously, Perry, as a member of the board of the library, we are deeply appreciative of your time. This was a very engaging, interesting, and educational um, discussion today. And to all of you who participated, 
I'm going to take another shot and remind you, the library uh, is dependent on sponsors like you um, to donate so that we can provide the collections, these events, and other things that make the library part of the community. The township provides the building and the staff. Everything else comes as a result of your generosity. And in this terrible season, we know that there are many difficult choices to make about where you donate money. We just ask that you consider the library when you are making those decisions. Janet, back to you. Ah, you're on mute, you're on mute, you're on mute. I just wanted to thank Perry Hamilton for a very engaging talk and I'm very excited to get onto that website. Uh, and also to Jerry Francis, who's always been a great friend to the library and whose lectures at the library have always brought huge crowds. To Leon Levine, our railway expert, uh, and to uh, all of the other people from the uh, Lower Marion Historical Society who really enrich our knowledge of the place where we live. Um, I will give another plug, uh, just like Michael, that our library needs our support more than ever. And think of us in your when you're doing your December donations. Thank you very, very much. And keep your eyes out for future programs, which we will publicize both on the library website and on our mailing list. Thank you. And actually, before I close this meeting, it occurs to me that there are this one group that we should also thank. Um, Autumn, Jean, JW. Um, yeah, they are the library staff that make these things happen. So we, as the board, are grateful. But frankly, you as people who participated should be grateful to Autumn, Jean, and JW for making this happen. All right, good night, everybody. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Stay safe. Fascinating. A pleasure. Great good to night. see you. Thank you.